Stan Efferding, aka The Rhino. He is the strongest bodybuilder in the world and one of my best references in terms of training and nutrition. He's one of only 10 men in the world to ever total over 2,300 pounds raw in competition. Stan studied exercise science at the University of Oregon and has been training high school, collegiate and professional athletes for over 25 years. Today he will share his views on what he considers to be the best practices for you to achieve your best results. Get ready to add some great value to your routines. This is the Bruce Willow Podcast. Get vertical. <laughs> That's it, man. <laughs> We're going to talk about uh, porn today. We're going to talk about erectile dysfunction. Get oh, vertical. man. Th that's that's what I've been struggling with, man. I I, I really need some help with yeah. that. Are you in Vegas right now? Can, can you can you let us in on yeah. what you're doing currently? Yeah, in Las Vegas, Nevada. You know, doing the same thing I've been doing since uh, since I retired from powerlifting. I'm helping other people. I'm uh, training athletes and just clients from all over the world. So w which uh, which uh, athletes or which which athletes, uh, for example, from CrossFit or per, from powerlifting or even strongman that are you working with right now? Uh, well, last year I worked with uh, Camille LeBlanc, CrossFit national champion, Ben Smith, yeah, uh, Becca Voigt, uh, strongman. You know, I worked with Brian Shaw, work with uh, uh, Hofthor Bjornsson. Yeah. Of course, he's just had some freakish deadlift yesterday. He's getting ready for the Arnold. But uh, the vast majority of the people I work with now are just dad bods and soccer moms trying to get healthy and uh, change their body composition. Oh, so uh, not only are you into elite performance, but you're also into uh, everyday people like trying to get a little healthier and, and stuff. That's that's what I, I was uh, meaning to ask you uh, for the longest time, uh, which is you seem very based, even though you started with bodybuilding and later on, obviously, powerlifting. But uh, you seemed very uh, focused on performance and not only the aesthetics. Uh, so how did it all begin for you? Well... I competed in both powerlifting and bodybuilding, and so I was bulking up to get as big and strong as I possibly could to powerlift, and then I was dieting down to get as uh, as ripped as I could for bodybuilding. And I learned along the way that there was, uh, you know, I made a lot of mistakes, and I learned that that your nutrition and your uh, certainly your general health. Uh, I had over a hundred blood tests throughout my career, and I used those to try and optimize health things like my cholesterol my blood pressure my blood sugars all those things had a huge impact on my performance in both directions and so it lent itself well not only to sports and athletics and competition uh, but just to general folks who are trying to to manage things like sleep apnea and high blood pressure and blood sugars and trying to hold on to lean body mass while they're losing weight um, all those things, I think, lent themselves well to the general population. When they started hearing about my, uh, how the training and nutrition programs that I applied to my athletes improved their general health, then they started reaching out to me to uh, work on those things for themselves. Oh, that's great. Because cause when you started, you were not a big guy at all. You were like 135 pounds or 140. Did I hear it correctly? <laughs> Yeah, I was in college. I weighed 140 pounds. My first bodybuilding show back in 1986, I weighed 158 on stage. So I wasn't a big guy. It took me a long, long time uh, to gain mass. And I learned a lot of lessons along the way, the things that you should eat and shouldn't eat to gain weight. And 
you know, I got fat a couple times trying to bulk up. Um, I also learned, you know, the best way to train along the way, which uh, now we've got, you know, an enormous amount of science that is, uh, you know, supported a lot of what I learned over the years. And uh, also when dieting, you know, I learned that there's an easy way to lose a whole lot of muscle if you're over restrictive and don't provide the right stimulus. I, I did it to myself on both ends of the spectrum many, many times throughout over 30 years of competing, both in bulking and in dieting. And so I, I use those lessons now to help people, whether they're athletes or not. So the, the common bodybuilding diet of chicken, broccoli, a little bit of uh, sweet potatoes or white rice uh, di did not work for you back then. So you had to tweak a little something that you got from a lot of tips from Flex Wheeler. Yeah, I discovered that when you're over restrictive, when you try and lose too much weight too fast, or uh, if you don't get adequate micronutrients in your diet, which is generally what happens now and, and has been happening for decades, um, meaning you just use egg whites and white fish and broccoli, uh, they're absent a lot of very important micronutrients such as iron and B12 and zinc and selenium and choline and biotin. And, I mean, you name it, the laundry list is extensive. And what would happen is twofold. One, you would lose an extraordinary amount of muscle because you would be doing too much cardio and too over restrictive on your diet, trying to drop too many calories and too much weight too fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'd start manifesting all kinds of health problems, uh, you know, iron deficiency, anemia, maybe for women, amenorrhea, um, you know, choline deficiencies, uh, biotin for skin, hair and nails. Now we get hypothyroidism. We have women with their hair falling out and I just noticed that when I did those restrictive diets that uh, I lost a lot of muscle and that was for me the most important thing, but also you get really tired and weak. Uh, it's unsustainable and you have these extraordinary rebounds where your body accumulates a lot of body fat right after competition. So I tried to manage all of that by just using a, a smarter diet. I was also cautious about digestive issues. It seems that That's something I suffered from throughout my career and, and it's been my experience that the vast majority of the athletes and, uh, you know, the regular folks that I deal with, um, they have experienced a lot of the same problems, IBS, IBD, uh, Crohn's, you know, all whole assortment of, um, of digestive issues that just it's really uncomfortable for them. And so I was able to, to sip through a, a diet plan that remedied all of those problems, both in terms of, of sufficient calories, uh, adequate micronutrients, um, more optimal uh, or diets that are low FODMAPs, they don't cause all the digestive problems. And I just kind of put it all together and, and put it out there as a, as a very specific diet plan. It's not the only path to the destination, but it's one that addresses a lot of the pretty uh, big issues that people experience when they diet. What I like about the vertical diet, and uh, we're going to step right into it because I really want our audience to know what the vertical diet is specifically. Uh, what I really like about it is that it, it's not extreme. I mean, you hear a lot of diets nowadays, and uh, I've had a lot of nutritionists here in my podcast that say the same thing, which is I don't really like a diet with a name because usually a diet with a name that's got a title, you know, like keto, like carnivore, like vegan, they're all too restrictive and they're all too... Uh, Uh, narrowing in terms of what you can eat so it's like carnivore only eats meat or basically only eats meat so uh, first of all I, I would like to know why do you call it vertical well I wanted first and foremost for people to be able to identify me uh, and the success that I've had with my athletes with a particular plan uh, it's something that I've been using for over 10 years just Stan Efferding's diet Um, but when I started having really popular, successful athletes, uh, you know, come out and have extraordinary results, uh, you know, I, I branded it as such so that more people would recognize it with my success, the success of my athletes. And, you know, as I mentioned, yeah. the vast majority of my clients aren't athletes. Uh, more so than anything, I wanted to use the vertical diet to say that you can't put a three bedroom house on a two bedroom foundation. And so I tried to build a foundation that upon which you could, uh, you know, you could create a skyscraper. You could, uh, the physiology is the same, whether it's a 450 pound Hofthor Bjornsson or whether it's a 97 pound professional ballet dancer from the Sacramento Ballet Company that I worked with. So I wanted to make sure that, that we kind of focused on micronutrients first. We can talk about the reasons why, but 
Um, I was tired of the, of, again, of the over restriction, which you just mentioned, and, the, and there's a place for that. I'll, I'll be quick to say that there's, I have clients that are keto, I have clients that are carnivore, I have clients that are vegan. There's a place for that, whether it's personal preference or whether they are experiencing some sort of health issue, be it uh, uh, diabetes or, um, you know, extreme, uh, I think uh, uh, we call it allergies or autoimmune disorders. Uh, I, I, I apply a diet that works for them first. I tried to create mine such that I, I didn't create more problems like I saw in the dieting industry, bodybuilding, figure, physique, bikini, um, or with the weight gain guys, the guys who experience metabolic syndrome from just eating a ton of pizza, pasta, pancakes, and driving calories uh, at the expense of their health. So I built this healthy foundation of micronutrients first and foremost, and I made sure it included all of the necessary uh, vitamins and minerals that uh, could, could uh, support a healthy lifestyle, whether it was just for energy or for controlling blood sugar or blood pressure uh, or optimizing sleep or performance for athletes. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, depending on their caloric demands, you know, the, the bigger uh, athletes or those that are training longer and harder, um, MMA fighters, CrossFitters, etc., they just need more calories to fuel workload. And I was cautious about the kind of calories that I fed them because I didn't want to create problems, digestive problems potentially. I didn't want to skew their uh, protein fat ratios too far in one direction so that uh, they might experience performance problems. Uh, so, uh, you know, on top of the foundation, I drove the calories that were necessary, the ones that were easy to digest and just lent themselves well to performance. I love that metaphor because uh on the one hand so we got two things here that i love the first one uh you emphasizing the fact that people are over emphasizing the macros i mean they're obviously important but i mean if if the foundation is not there and i guess you call it the horizontal plane right the horizontal plane is the micros sure. that really have to be the foundation and then the vertical is what you might keep um, this, this is probably not a good expression but keep piling up Uh, until you get the necessary calories that you need. But you can't really pile up anything. You can't really pile up the macros without the horizontal being well, uh, solidly stood. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. You cannot build a, a great athlete on an inadequate foundation of micronutrients. It just won't happen eventually. And athletes have a greater demand for these micronutrients than sedentary individuals. We notice that athletes have a, a higher rate of deficiencies. Uh, we notice they suffer from more frequency of cold and flu uh, simply because of the demands that they place on their body. And so I'm even more adamant about uh, making sure the micronutrients are sufficient to support their workload. Yeah. What, what are some of the best foods that you would uh, tell people to, to consume if you don't want that, uh, that uh, uh, stomach, those uh, stomach problems that you were talking about, like uh, foods that are high, high in the FODMAPs or, or in this case, low in the FODMAPs, right? Yep. Well, we just go straight to the FODMAP menu. There's a lot of science behind it. Uh, Monash uh, has done a great job. There's a lot of uh, research that's been done to show that 60% to 80% of people with IBS uh, realize significant improvements in their digestive distress when they utilize low FODMAP foods. That's mm -hmm. fermentable oligo dye, monosaccharides, and polyols. Those are the kinds of foods that might be high in, say, you know, phytic acid uh, or um, uh, you know, gluten for some people. And that, again, that mm -hmm. just kind of depends on who it is. Uh, The, the kinds of foods that cause a lot of gas and bloating, they created a pretty specific list. And it's a, it's a, a, a large list. And although I'm very specific about the kinds of foods that I recommend to my clients because they want a very uh, easy to follow detailed plan when we come out of the gate, I also provide lots of substitution options. And those are on the FODMAP menu. An example would be for a lot of people, grains can be hard to digest. Uh, I might go with a a sourdough bread because it's been fermented and it's easier to digest. Some people do have uh, celiac disease and have a gluten um, allergy and they can't take gluten. That's only a very small percentage of people, uh, but we need to pay attention to the fact that those kinds of foods can aggravate their digestion. Even something like oats, unless you soak and ferment them, can be harder to digest. And I, I'm cautious to say that these foods aren't necessarily bad for you, 
but they're more likely to cause digestive distress. And some people respond worse than others. I say it's individualistic. It's dose dependent, how much of them you eat matters. And uh, it's cumulative. So whether or not you can uh, tolerate a bowl of oatmeal on Monday morning uh, might not say anything for what you would feel like to, after eating it Tuesday and Wednesday morning. By Wednesday, all of a sudden you're bloated and gassy and you can't figure out why. And that's because some of these foods have a cumulative effect. And then how they're prepared matters, as I mentioned, in terms of soaking and fermenting or how well you cook your high raffinose vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower and asparagus. If you cook them soft, they tend to be more digestible than not. Uh, and then there's foods that, that there's really doesn't matter how you prepare them. If you can't digest them very well, such as vegetable oils, some people mm -hmm. have a a problem with gastric distress from seed oils, canola, soybean, corn, and safflower, those kinds of things. Sugar alcohols, which are found in most gums and protein bars and a lot of protein powders and things like uh, Halo Top ice cream. Uh, sugar alcohols are indigestible and they can cause diarrhea. You know, yeah. we know about legumes, they could be difficult to digest. Uh, you know, the lectins that are in the beans, and unless they're soaked and fermented, it can be difficult to digest. And uh, you know, they say beans, beans, the musical fruit, the more you eat, the more you toot. Uh, there's a reason for the rhyme. And, yeah. <laughs> and that's, uh, they could be hard to digest. Even something like historically, people would always assume that brown rice was better than white rice. They would yeah. assume that it had more micronutrients. Well, first of all, there's very little micronutrients in brown rice. Uh, secondly, they're very close in terms of glycemic index, which is a, a whole nother can of worms that, that uh, is completely negated by eating proteins and fats with your carbs, uh, but they have phytic acid and that can bind to minerals and electrolytes. It could be hard to digest in any significant quantity. Uh, some of my athletes have to consume, you know, 300, 400, 500, up to a thousand grams of carbs a day, depending on the size of the athlete and their workload. I can't load them full of things like brown rice and legumes and oats and grains, you know, pizza, yeah. pasta, pancakes and breads and spaghettis and, and the like. Uh, they'll just be bloated and, and gassy and, and uh, have troubles with digestion. Onions and garlic, there's a couple more that uh, can cause digestive distress that are high on the FODMAP menu. And even something like coffee, it's a kind of a double-edged sword. Caffeine may perform some, uh, provide some performance enhancing benefits, but it can also cause uh, uh, impaired digestion. It uh, speeds up peristalsis, so you get mineral malabsorption, maybe some diarrhea, uh, so I'm, I'm really cautious about when I come out of the gate, the foods that I feed people and how it affects their digestion, their performance, their sleep, uh, all of those things, and, and whether or not it even impedes absorption of other minerals and electrolytes. We know a lot of these uh, high raffinose vegetables can impede the uptake of iodine, which is very important for athletes who sweat it out and don't consume it in their diet. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm cautious to focus on all those things first, and then uh, we, you know, we can gradually reintroduce certain foods and then we'll have a better baseline as to how they affect your digestion and how you feel on them. That's what's most important to me. And those are the questions I ask. How do you feel? How's your mm -hmm. stomach? How's your, uh, uh, your uh, regularity, the quality of your stool? How's your performance? How's your energy throughout the day? Uh, how's your strength, obviously? So those things are all questions that I ask to, to try and um, you know, hone in on uh, you know, getting a, a better diet for these people. And so we talked about what not to eat. I'm happy to talk about what I recommend to eat. Yeah, what would be good foods uh, for the micronutrients for the horizontal plane? Am I saying it right? Horizontal plane? Access. Yeah, I think Access. that's good. The foundation, the foundation <laughs> of the diet, you know, first and foremost, you, we know that calories are king and that if you want to gain size, you got to be in a calorie surplus. And if you want to lose weight, you got to be in a calorie deficit. There's no way to deny that, irrespective of what diet you're on. Uh, and then secondary to that, macros are important, uh, protein being the number one macro. Uh, it's both best for performance in terms of gaining lean body mass and for retaining muscle tissue when dieting. It's also very satiating, has a high thermic effect of food, so you get uh, you know fewer net calories. You can raise proteins pretty high on people that are dieting and it helps satiate them. Uh, some people talk about keto diets as being satiating, but it's really the protein in that diet that is uh, the satiating uh, macro. And so when I'm dieting people down, I, I keep their protein pretty high, 1.2 grams per pound. So when I'm building the foundation, I start with a host of quality protein sources that are also very micronutrient dense. A lot of people start eating things like egg whites, 
because they think that the fat and the yolk is going to, uh, you know, usurp their, uh, their diet. And in fact, what we found is, is that in studies where you compare two groups of people, one who consume egg whites, one who consume whole eggs, and when you equate for protein consumption between the two, the whole egg consumers have a significantly greater uh, hypertrophy response and strength outcome. So performance is dependent upon micronutrients in addition to getting adequate protein. It seems that the choline and the biotin and the K2 and all of the things that are in the egg yolk uh, contribute to performance and muscle, you know, lean muscle retention. Same thing's true with uh, red meat. Uh, ruminant animals have three times as much zinc, uh, six times as much uh, iron, I think, and 12 times or 10 times as much B12 as uh, monogastric animals like chicken, turkey, even pork, all monogastric animals. It's not to say those are bad protein sources, but if in a good, better, best scenario, I'm going to choose the one, the, the ruminant animal that has a four-chambered stomach that can convert cellulose fiber into a more energy uh, sufficient nutrient source for humans also has a better omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, usually three to one or six to one in a ruminant like a cow or a sheep uh, or deer um, uh, or bison. All of those animals that, uh, that ferment the cellulose fiber that they eat. Chickens and turkeys don't. They have a 17 or a 25 to one depending on uh, what they're fed omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. It's not that you you be searching for omega-3s in those foods, but they're just not as efficient in converting their feed into, um, into micronutrients that are available for us as the consumers. So I throw definitely throw red meat in there. Um, again, I mentioned I have eggs in there. Salmon twice a week gets your EPA and DHA, just uh, five ounces of salmon twice a week and get you your two grams of EPA, DHA a day or your you know, 14 grams a week, which is about all the research suggests is necessary to, to give you those essential fatty acids. Um, and uh, I would say dairy, another very important one, uh, not only for calcium, but uh, for nerve signaling and for muscle fiber contraction. Uh, it's, it's great for controlling uh, iron overload for men. Uh, it's obviously great for calcium for women. So uh, what, do you, what do you like for dairy, dairy? In there as well? What do you like for One dairy? Is it Greek yogurt? What do you like for dairy? I Is it Greek, Greek yogurt? yogurt. Yeah. 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 More people tend to not respond well to milk because of the lactose. Yeah. But can, uh, they can assimilate, uh, in many, many more people can assimilate Greek yogurt. If we have to go a step further in terms of minimizing uh, lactose, when we go to a cheddar cheese, we go to a hard aged cheese, those are almost lactose free. And we see that, uh, you know, this has been studied extensively and there, there is no evidence that, uh, that it increases inflammation. There's actually plenty of evidence to, to suggest if you're going to look at the epidemiology that uh, those, those uh, populations who consume the most dairy are the leanest and have the, uh, the, the healthiest uh, health outcomes. Uh, they're also some of the um, tallest people in the world. You look at our, uh, you know, in Holland and, and, uh, and over there in Norway, and you, you get some of the the, uh, the benefits of the dairy that they consume. Some people squawk about saturated fat, but the, the highest saturated fat consumers in the world, you know, you're talking about France and Switzerland, uh, they have the lowest rates of cardiovascular disease. So, uh, you know, I'm not all, I'm not for sucking down tubes of, you know, butter or containers of, of uh, coconut oil in terms of saturated fat, but I certainly don't demonize it. Uh, my diet's probably right around 10% saturated fat, understanding that red meat is over 50% monounsaturated fats to begin with, and it's only, you know, 25 to 30% of the total caloric intake. So uh, all of those things tend to make a, a pretty, uh, you know, generally healthy diet, uh, even, you know, based on the naysayers with respect to saturated fat, which is, uh, you know, now starting to turn the other direction to saying you can't be so uh, myopic about a particular nutrient. You have to look at it uh, in, you know, in the whole diet and the whole lifestyle structure in terms of sleep, body weight, exercise, all of those things uh, have a huge impact as well. So yeah. once I get my proteins in, then, uh, you know, the fats in my mind are in the proteins. Mm -hmm. You've got fats in your meats, you've got fats in your eggs, you've eggs. got fats yeah. in your dairy, you've got fats in your salmon. Uh, and I, I just mentioned about monounsaturated fats, and I managed mentioned about the omega threes, the EPA, DHA, and salmon. So we're getting all those covered. Um, I don't need to add any additional fats. Certainly not any oils, 
if somebody wants to put, you know, a little bit of, um, of uh, olive oil on their salad, that's fine. It, it is a calorie and, and it's a dense calorie. And so if you're trying to um, shoot for weight loss, then you, you're going to want to definitely pay attention to that. Uh, so fats, I think, are going to be in those, those sources. When I have a client that's trying to, to lose weight, and particularly one that's trying to compete in something, in bodybuilding, figure, physique, or what have you, I might go from a full fat dairy uh, yogurt to a 2% and then maybe eventually to a skim just to start to slowly bring the fats down, never below 0.3 grams per pound, but uh, you know, to, to try and titrate those down over time. When I worked with Nadia Wyatt, who took third in the Miss Olympia, we started her with a New York steak, and then we brought her down to a top sirloin, and then we brought her down to a sirloin tip or a top round, and then we could even go one step further to a grass-finished uh, sirloin tip. And as you can see, each step of the way, you're reducing fats without reducing protein, without reducing iron, without reducing B12, all the important things that, that she needed. And we kept the yolks in the whole time. We certainly didn't substitute peanut butter for egg yolks. That's a uh, just a tragedy that <laughs> seems to keep occurring. Yes. <laughs> so I've got my proteins and fats, and now we look at carbs. And I like to start my carbs with the foundation is those that are nutrient dense. Uh, first and foremost, uh, potassium. And I get that from a daily potato. Just a regular potato is gets you a thousand milligrams of potassium. It's two or three times that of a banana. So it, it's very valuable, giving you both some. Uh, plus, it's got some some prebiotic resistant starch. If, if that's uh, your goal in terms of uh, uh, you know, populating the, the large intestine. Um, then fruit as well. Fruits, 400 milligrams of potassium. Uh, potatoes and fruit, particularly oranges, are very satiating. If you look at the satiety index, they're amongst the highest uh, satiating foods. For people who are dieting, that becomes really important because uh, you know, people who are dieting, there's two main reasons why they fail on a diet. Because they're hungry or they're tired. And uh, I try and mitigate the problem of being tired by getting adequate sodium and a lot of micronutrients, and uh, as we mentioned, with all the foods that we're eating. Uh, but as for hunger, uh, I keep the protein high, and I make sure that, uh, that they're getting adequate potassium and using foods that are high in the satiety index. And that's going to be uh, fiber. It's going to be uh, foods like potatoes and, and fruit. I throw some carrots in there for fiber. I use low gas vegetables. The root tubers like a carrot or a potato are pretty low gas. They're pretty easy to digest depending on quantity. I just put a, two or three baby carrots in with a couple meals a day. Uh, we use things like spinach and uh, uh, we use some cucumber, maybe some squash, the kinds of vegetables that'll give me a lot of potassium but not give me a lot of gas. Uh, I also throw in, in that, uh, well, and then if they have to eat more carbohydrates to fuel a greater workload, and that's, you know, your CrossFitters, your MMA fighters, your strong men, uh, powerlifters don't use a lot of carbs. I know they think that they need them, but in fact, their, their workload, they might burn two or 300 cal calories in an hour of training. There's a lot of sitting around. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not too concerned about driving a lot of carbs into powerlifters. I do need to get them to eat enough calories to maintain their muscle, however. And so then I'm, that's when I'm pushing white rice. That's when a Hofdor Bjornsson who eats 1,200 grams or almost 5,000 calories of just white rice a day wow. on top of his foundational foods and his protein intake, he can digest that. And even if I have to sprinkle a tiny little bit of dextrose to make it uh, easier to, to eat and to digest, it seems that the two sugars, especially those that, that, uh, that uh, uh, increase amylase production, both in the mouth and in the pancreas, so that you can start to digest those, those starches in, in the small intestine, uh, that little bit of dextrose can help really, really help people uh, digesting these and, and then be hungrier sooner uh, and eventually be able to eat a lot more calories if necessary to fuel their workload. Some of these CrossFitters have to eat 5,000 calories a day. They're training you know, two or three times a day for three or four hours a day. And I can't fill them full of quinoa and brown rice. It just, it won't work. Uh, you know, even look at some of the great cost fitters talk about how much sugar they eat, just Oreos and milk, you know, skim milk, uh, kind of the same thing. They're, they're driving a lot of sugars because that's what they're burning and that's the most efficient fuel for anaerobic performance. So yeah. that, there was, that there gets was you a, protein, uh, gets you 
I'm so sorry, sorry for Go interrupting. Ahead. There was a lot of tribalism in the in the early days with with CrossFit, and I have a lot of uh, CrossFit mm -hmm. followers, and uh, they they yeah. basically they were all into the zone diet or the paleo diet. But but then you would look yeah. at the actual competitors and the actually elite level competitors, and they were all all about a little bit more like bodybuilding with a few extras type of diet what type of mistakes or or, or uh, basic mistakes did the crossfitters make that you uh, dealt with uh i think simple carbs and and um, digestibility fodmaps was the huge thing oh, they reintroduced okay. potatoes that originally they they shunned potatoes and they figure out that that's a that's a starch that can be very beneficial because of the the potassium content in particular athletes sweat out a lot of sodium a lot of potassium uh, obviously a lot of iodine. So, you know, on top of the food that I feed them, I'm making sure that they salt all their meals. Uh, Becca and Ben Smith, you know, Ben Smith ended up with heat stroke. Um, that's kind of what reason he came to me two years ago uh, because he didn't have enough um, electrolytes in his diet. And so I reached out to Dr. Sandra Godick, who is a PhD in, um, uh, in exercise phys, and she runs the Heat Institute. She's a uh, thermal regulation and hydration expert um, and you know she gave me a protocol that I utilized on all of these athletes on Hofthor, on Shaw, on uh, Ben Smith, on, on Becca Voigt and really it was kind of sodium uh, prioritizing sodium intake salting every meal to taste having a salt shaker next to your plate and salting all of your meals to taste throughout the day your tongue will determine whether or not you want more or less it's not like sugar it does, you don't just keep piling it on and Taking sodium before and after training, 500 milligrams is a minimum. That's recommended by the International Society of Sports Nutrition. And then when you get, uh, you know, a high-performing athlete that's in a hot climate that's got a 40-minute uh, endurance event, that they might need more. They might need 1,000 milligrams of sodium, which is about a half teaspoon of salt. And they can just take that straight up, or they can use thermo tabs or something, buffered salt tablets. But uh, all of my athletes take sodium before and after training. It's beneficial for uh, stamina and endurance, uh, also for recovery from workouts. And so uh, that was, I think, something that wasn't focused on. Uh, also, the white rice being so digestible and giving you so many, uh, you know, necessary carbohydrates for, for CrossFit performance. Uh, they were just eating sugar, and there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, in terms of absorption rates, uh, any two sugars, it's, it's like table sugar, sucrose and fructose, uh, it, it absorbs at twice the rate of just a single sugar. So when you're trying to rehydrate somebody or, or give somebody uh, or get them to uh, restore their glycogen that they've, that they've depleted during training, I recommend this after each workout or event for a high performing athlete. I have them take in two types of sugar. It goes from absorbing one gram a minute to absorbing two grams a minute. So it could be a dextrose and a maltodextrin or it could be a dextrose and fructose. Um, I think that's what Sandra Godic uses in her Levelin product is a dextrose and maltodextrin. Um, I like the two to one ratio of dextrose and fructose. Uh, I like the fact that it, 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 uh, you get some liver glycogen and some muscle glycogen in the same drink. And I think it's, uh, it's been shown in research to minimize gastric distress as long as you're drinking it relatively slowly and not just guzzling it. Um, also, when you add salt to that mixture and when you add caffeine to that mixture, you can go up to maybe three or four grams a minute of absorption rate. And that's just a small amount of caffeine just to help increase absorption. This isn't a, a physiological amount of it's not 600 milligrams of caffeine like you might use for a performance benefit. Mm -hmm. It's just 100 milligrams of caffeine for, uh, to increase absorption of the, uh, of the sugars. And sugars with sodium, uh, sugars act as sort of a, a, a shuttle to take sodium into the muscles as well. Um, that, that drink is what uh, you know, the UFC fighters use when they step off of the scale after a hard weight cut. It's what the CrossFitters are, are using. It's certainly what I used with the CrossFit athletes that I worked with and the strongmen in those hot climates in Manila or Florida when they're doing the world's strongest man. We have to pay a lot of attention to how much sodium and water they take in because uh, it's not just about how much water you drink, it's, it's how much electrolytes you have mm -hmm. uh, in your system. You could actually dehydrate yourself by taking in too much water. Uh, I've had many CrossFitters come to me feeling horrible. Uh, they were drinking a gallon or two gallons of water a day, but weren't salting their food and, wasn't, and weren't taking sodium before and after training. And that one fix 
was life-changing for so many people. I've got more emails and DMs from people all over the world that when they started adding sodium, they stopped getting lightheaded, they had more endurance and stamina, they quit hitting the wall in the middle of their workouts, they recovered faster, they just generally felt better in terms of their overall energy and sense of well-being. That's that's uh, uh, such a balanced way of looking at everything with research behind it. Not a, not not like yeah. a lot of uh, you YouTubers and Instagrammers that we always check out yeah. on on Instagram. The one thing that's that's yeah. actually a, a great takeaway, even for uh, our Portuguese audience and people from Mediterranean countries. Our Mediterranean diet is very rich in good salt. We have one of the best salts yep. in the world, maybe, uh, which is like a sea salt. So I know you always yep. talk about the, the the pink salt, the Himalayan salt, but actually our Portuguese salt is very good as well. So I would recommend that people not only use the, the pink salt, but also our salt is really uh, top notch. But we do have a lot of... We, in Portuguese, we call it refugado, which means that whenever you cook something, you put a little bit of uh, uh, onions and garlic and whatnot. And it's like it's like a, a huge seasoning fest that's going uh, um, that's going uh, with each meal. So you have like the the olive, the, the olive oil, the, the the garlics, the pieces of garlic, the pieces of onions. And actually, I, I have a phobia of onions. So I'm really glad that you said that uh, onions are, are are very high in the FODMAP groups. Yes, screw onions. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we put a lot of that stuff in, in our meals. And I realized that I'm burping my meal like three or four hours later. And if I'm uh, uh, if I want to be an athlete, and if I, I either a bodybuilder, you know, an aesthetics athlete, or a performance athlete, or in my case, I'm a stuntman, so I have to be kind of ready for everything. So, activities like CrossFit really translate well into my profession. Uh, I really have to not be burping my food all the time. So it's really very balanced that way of looking at stuff. So you got the micros, you got the piling of the of the macronutrients without being something that will bloat you, bloat you or uh, make you uncomfortable when it's time uh, for working out. As for the red meats, I'm sure, Stan, that you've been getting a lot of Uh, uh, messages or emails about the game changers and all this controversy. I'm not going to bother you with that very much, but uh, is are are these claims that red meat is bad for you any good? Is there any substanti substantiated evidence that red meat is bad for you? No, what none whatsoever. None whatsoever. This has been a long history of epidemiology. The, the red meat's been demonized by. Um, you know, ethical vegans in terms of uh, what their preference is that people don't eat animals. Uh, they're conflating their personal agenda with uh, trying to scare people with fear mongering into not eating red meat. Uh, the most recent uh, study that uh, analyzed all of the research that, that these vegan groups have been putting out for years uh, demonstrated that the epidemiology is completely worthless to begin with, completely worthless. Dr. Ioannidis Uh, out of Stanford has, has debunked this many times that this, these food frequency questionnaires that are uh, highly biased, uh, that, that don't take into account the healthy user bias, uh, that they've been debunked over and over again. And then when you look at the randomized controlled trials, uh, you don't see a difference in health outcomes when you control for things like smoking and drinking and, and body weight. Yes. Uh, it seems that people who, you know, the healthy user bias is when You know, people who eat more vegetables tend to weigh less, smoke less, drink less, and exercise more. And people who eat more red meat also tend to drink a bunch of sodas and fries, and uh, and they tend to weigh more and smoke more and drink more and exercise less. So uh, when you eliminate the healthy user bias, as they've done in many studies, uh, they did one at Whole Foods where they took uh, groups of people who shop at Whole Foods and they broke them up into two groups, one that um, was primarily vegetable-based and one that was primarily meat-based. They have equivalent health outcomes. And so you can't be myopic and you can't use your uh, personal ethics uh, and fear mongering to try and scare people out of eating red meats. They're extraordinarily uh, nutrient dense. They are the only superfood. You know, kale and, and acai berry or however you pronounce it yeah. is not something you can sustain yourself on. Yeah. Uh, red meat, if you, you know, we talked earlier about elimination diets and carnivore. I, I have many clients who have pretty severe autoimmune disorders and digestive issues and skin disorders. Uh, that's where we start. We start with an elimination diet that starts with red meat. It's the most highly digestible 
uh, food that has the by far the greatest micronutrient profile. You can sustain yourself on it. And at the same time, for a great many of these people, as we see with the carnivore diet group for, with Dr. Sean Baker and Paul Saladino, uh, we're getting an enormous amount of feedback from people who have uh, dramatically decreased their symptoms that have been the result of eating foods that, that they couldn't digest. So uh, there's absolutely no concern with red meat consumption. You, you have to get adequate protein. I'll say a gram per pound of body weight. If you're a 200 pound person, you need 200 grams of protein. That's going to be about 30 ounces a day. Uh, and you can mix that between your dairy and your eggs and your red meat and your salmon. Uh, and if you can tolerate it, you can throw in some legumes and uh, you know, if that's something that you can, you can tolerate and, uh, you know, some oatmeal, it's up to you. But the fact of the matter is, is that, that the more micronutrient dense protein sources are going to be better for your overall health. And so, uh, I think it's unfortunate that, that people get their information from, uh, Netflix videos, which was yeah. a highly biased, uh, video. You know, it was, it was produced by James Cameron, who mm -hmm. owns the largest pea plant in North America, which I think is is obviously a, a bias. Yeah, um, he's trying to sell you pea protein, which you know we, I think we saw in the research that's uh, causing heart attacks in dogs, and so uh, I'm not too inclined to suck down a bunch of pea protein with that kind of evidence out there. Um, right. So I have no problem recommending red meat. I, I think it's it's uh, extremely healthy and preferential for a whole host of reasons, not just performance, but for retention of lean body mass. I think they just came out with another recent study. I'm forgetting the school that they did it out. It might have been, uh, I'm not going to mention because I, I don't recall, but um, they they had their whole staff go on a vegan diet for a month and they used uh, uh, MRI technology to look at their uh, lean body mass and found that they all lost muscle tissue. So uh, to me, that's I think that's counterproductive to health. I think retention of lean muscle tissue is kind of how this entire diet and this whole conversation started uh, was focusing on, the, you know, the kind of the most important substrate for, for uh, I think, long-term health, which is going to be your lean body mass. You know, it, the thing is, I, I believe that, and we get a lot of this even sometimes, for example, I have a podcast here in Portugal, you know, it's a small country, but we do have a lot of quality people in our area, in our theme. But sometimes it's very difficult for me to find good guests because a lot of them are not really on social media or I don't know where they are. I, I would have to go to colleges or I would have to uh, search around or peep around. And sometimes the academic people or the more academic people, the people who are into or, or really are in the research uh, field or are every day in the, the gym teaching people, other people, they're a little bit uh, averse to, uh, to the social media. So if those people, people like you, aren't on social media. And in, in this case, I've, I'm obviously very grateful that people like you, like Mark Bell, like Joe Rogan, you know, like the, the people who are actually doing a doing something for information uh, uh, in regards to information. Um, I, I'm glad that you guys are on the front line as well, because otherwise all, all that people would get access to would be uh, crap and would be Netflix and would be those people who are trying to create a little bit of tribalism in their ideas, uh, wh whether it be vegan or or even other types of, of things. What I'm really worried about, Stan, is that uh, people are, are starting to get too extreme, even with the carnivore diet. It seems like, you know, it's it's not like it's not producing a lot of good results. But we are kind of getting into this era where, where everything is a challenge, like the paleo challenge or the carnivore challenge. Why would anybody just eat meat for one month if they can really have a more balanced approach and try other things? So um, what do you think about this this whole challenge era where people try stuff for like one month? And then, I mean, is there any sort of adhesion to the the, the protocols with this type of, of – of, um, of approach? Well, you said something very important there. Uh, adherence. The best diet's the one you'll follow. We've seen uh, diets have been studied. I mean, there's been over 20,000 diets studied um, in the literature for extended periods of time. And we find that after 12 months, they all have similar outcomes, regardless of the diet. The, the number one factor being is whether or not 
they were complied with, whether or not the diet was adhered to. I always say compliance is the science. And I have an obesity video where I talk about the fact that whether it's the McDonald's diet or the uh, ice cream diet or the, um, um, what was the one uh, somebody was eating, like 7-Eleven diet, uh, <laughs> all of those resulted in weight loss. And the weight loss is the driver of the health outcomes. And so all of these people improved their blood sugar, blood pressure, their uh, lipid profile. Uh, they've increased their VO2 max just by taking walks every day. So if I'm going to step back and, and paint with a broad brush and try and help as many people as possible, I'm going to help them to lose weight first and foremost. Um, the caveat to that is, is I don't want to create uh, too restrictive of a diet like an HCG diet with, you know, 800 calories a day or something that's micronutrient deficiency deficient so that it may manifest in some sort of B12, long-term B12 deficiency, which is uh, horrible or iron deficiency for anemia. So with that caveat, the best diet is the one you'll follow. And um, the idea of experimenting, it, it kind of gives people an opportunity to figure out which diet works best for them, whether it's keto or whether it's carnivore. Um, I have done both of those. I've dieted under 50 grams of carbs many times throughout my career in bodybuilding. And I found that that did not work for me. I found that I lost too much size and strength and I was tired and I had brain fog and um, I didn't enjoy that diet. Uh, one thing I did find when I did more uh, lower carb is that I wasn't hungry as often. And that may be a critical component for compliance for some people that when they start to introduce carbs, they might eat too much too often. And uh, it's kind of similar to the intermittent fasting thing. It, it, if you control for calories and protein, you get equivalent outcomes, whether you eat in a 16-8 or you eat in a 12-12. If you control for calories and protein, whether you're high carb or low carb or high fat or low fat, you have equivalent outcomes. Uh, so it doesn't seem to matter. All the research continually points to the fact that, that when you control for calories and protein, you get equivalent outcomes in terms of weight loss and lean body mass retention. But if you let people eat libitum just by choice and you, and you uh, put them on a 16-8 diet, they tend to eat less because they're eating fewer hours of the day. If you let them eat ad libitum and you put them on a keto diet, they do tend to be less hungry and eat a little less. They're more satiated. So you see the difference there is, is when you control for something as opposed to when you just let people uh, eat as they feel, but you just control carbohydrates or you control the time eating window. It, it generally tends to be more of a behavioral change in terms of, of, uh, of appetite, of satiation. Having said that, just because you're a little more satiated doesn't mean you can comply with a 16, eight intermittent fast, or doesn't mean you can comply with a keto diet. They have the same rates of, of recidivism is, is the unfortunate thing. So uh, I think the goal long-term uh, is to focus on things that help people comply with the diet. One, is it something that fits their lifestyle? If a 16-8 fits their lifestyle, great. But if they enjoy eating breakfast, then you shouldn't you know, force them into a 16-8. Uh, if carnivore satisfies them and they enjoy steak and eggs every day, uh, that's fine. Again, you know, some people with um, you know, autoimmune disorders and digestive disorders may choose the carnivore for a very different reason. But if it's mm -hmm. just a diet for maintaining your health long term, can you comply with it? Or do you need some carbohydrates here and there? So I focus, even in my diet, with compliance. I focus with uh, uh, things like the number one uh, uh, method of complying with the diet is, food, is meal prep. Whether you prep or you buy meals from someone else, uh, that's kind of why I started a meal prep company. I found that it was so successful. That's what the bodybuilding figure physique and bikini industry does very, very well. They mm -hmm. prep their meals. They walk around with their bags full of food and their plastic containers. And we might laugh at them, but guess what? Those are the people that are losing the most weight and getting on stage in a bikini. Uh, not that that's the be all end all, but the fact of the matter is, is if you have you know, properly portioned food, uh, pre-cooked and, and sitting in your fridge waiting for you, it's pretty easy to comply with your diet. I, I'm a big proponent of packing your meals and taking them with you. I talk about the thermos that I, was life-changing for me. You know, I don't even sell them. You, they're 20 bucks on Amazon. You can get a, a 24 ounce thermos and you can, when you cook a meal, you pop a second meal into the thermos. And now whether you're getting on an airplane to travel 
uh, or you're going to pick the kids up at school and you got to take them to piano lessons or a sport, you're not ending up at a fast food place because you got your little thermos in there with whatever, you know, 350 or 450 calories that you're supposed to have. It's a blend of your, you know, proteins, fats and carbs that you prefer. Uh, it's the kinds of foods that don't cause you digestive distress. So, you, you know, you don't end up eating at a restaurant and ending up with diarrhea and, and you know, a host of other problems. And overeating, which is generally what happens when you eat out or eat, you know, uh, when you're hungry, you tend to overeat. So, you know, meal prep is the big, is the number one thing that I promote to people in terms of, uh, of compliance with their diet. Uh, another thing is, is more sleep, trying to remedy the, the sleep problem because your, uh, your ghrelin uh, will decrease. If you don't get adequate sleep, your body releases the hunger hormone, which is ghrelin. Now you're hungrier. And if you're shortening your sleeping window to six hours or five hours, now you're up for 18 or 19 hours. You just have more opportunity to eat. We talked about intermittent fasting and restricting the feeding window. Well, if you get less sleep, you're going to increase the feeding window. And it also shows that your hormones are such when you don't get adequate sleep that you're burning more fat than muscle throughout the day. and, and uh, Or more muscle than fat, I'm sorry, particularly yes, yes. in terms of weight loss. If you don't get adequate sleep, your body starts, starts burning up muscle like crazy and holding on to the fat. So I don't encourage people to get up at 4 a.m. and do cardio. I think it's, uh, as I said many times, stepping over $100 bills to pick up nickels. I think you create a, uh, a hormonal environment uh, behind the scenes that causes you to, to catabolize muscle tissue. So all of those things to me, uh, the 10-minute walks, I'm also cautious that I don't have just regular dieters over training. If you go, and this isn't a knock on CrossFit, but if your thought is that you're going to burn calories to lose weight, uh, a, that's not terribly effective. It's been shown in the research that that uh, that you take two groups of people, one that just diets and one that diets and exercises, and they have pretty similar health outcomes or, or weight loss outcomes. Um, now, exercise is great for health and cardiovascular fitness, but it doesn't seem to be so good for weight loss. Two things happen uh, when you go in and you crush yourself in the gym. You get a personal trainer and they beat you up for an hour. Uh, one, you're tired, so you go home and you sit more. And you're hungry so you go home and you eat more and so it's kind of a zero-sum game you go to the gym and you crush yourself and then you come home and you sit around and eat and that's what we're finding is we call that compensation and so i'm cautious that's why i just introduced a few 10-minute walks to regulate blood sugars and to improve digestion and to get your step count up that low intensity steady state work is better for burning fat and retaining lean body lean muscle tissue um, and uh, just some sensible weight training to uh, create the stimulus so that you don't lose muscle. And I'm, again, I'm not talking about going to the gym and crushing yourself. I'm, I'm talking about scientific principles of training each body part twice a week, doing 10 to 20 sets a week, um, using a, a weight that uh, the weight doesn't really matter, just getting within a rep or two of failure, whether it's sets of five or 12 or 20, whatever, um, you know, uh, rep range that you enjoy the most, the exercises you enjoy the most, just some lower body work, a little bit of push, a little bit of pull. So I have everybody do some sort of exercise, but I'm cautious with the non math that I don't overtrain them because they end up free and then just sitting around all day and uh, just staying on your feet and getting more sleep uh, are two of the most effective ways to improve weight loss. You touched on a great point that has become your trademark and even here in portugal i put a lot of people because of you i put a lot of people on those 10 minute walks which is that instead of doing the steady state cardio which is boring yeah. <laughs> it's just boring and and sometimes it might be able to even hinder your sleeping patterns just like you said uh why not just after each meal if you have like two or three big meals a day in discounting or even counting the snacks uh in mid-afternoon or mid-morning if you go for five or 10 minute walk you can actually add up and not only burn more calories but even in terms of metabolic rates you're increasing your metabolic rate and getting a ton of benefits with it right yeah it's important for so many reasons one it improves digestion it uh, the muscles the muscular contractions uh help with digestion you know the stomach is a a, a muscle that contracts to, to help uh, beat the food up and digest it and, and you know convert it into chyme and uh, also, the enzymes, it increases enzymatic release for digestion. Uh, another big piece is the blood flow. Again, this isn't a, you know, this isn't a hit session or a workout. This is just a 10-minute walk. Yeah. Um, a huge one is insulin control. 
uh, it, a 10-minute walk after a meal is twice as effective as metformin, which is the number one prescribed diabetes drug in the world uh, for reducing blood sugars and preventing onset of type 2 diabetes. Twice as effective. It's been studied what they call lifestyle, 150 minutes of, uh, of general activity a week. So three 10-minute walks a day is going to be 210 minutes a week. So it dramatically improves blood sugars. Your muscles will take glucose out of the blood without the need of insulin. So your blood sugar spikes are lower uh, and of less duration, and your insulin doesn't need to raise as high. Um, and the insulin, uh, you know, I'm not saying that, that just because you eat carbs that an insulin uh, is released that you're going to store fat. That, that has nothing to do with it. It's a calorie equation first and foremost. But we see that, that in chronic states of high blood sugar and high insulin, uh, that it creates a lot of the metabolic diseases, the metabolic syndrome, the fatty liver, the high blood pressure, uh, the high blood sugars, high triglycerides, uh, damage to the endothelial wall for, you know, a, a precursor of, of heart disease. All of those things occur as a result of inactivity. Uh, we've also seen studies that show that, that the frequency is more important than the volume, that three 10-minute walks a day is far better than one 30-minute walk at the end of the day. The body likes to be moved more frequently. They took studies where they had sedentary people, say office workers, and they broke them up into two groups. And one group did a 30 minute uh, exercise at the end of the day. The other group moved around for three or four minutes out of each hour. And the 30 minutes at the end of the day had no decrease in all cause mortality uh, over sedentary people. And the people who moved around three or four minutes out of every hour, just got up and walked around, uh, had dramatically improved uh, decrease in all-cause mortality and, and uh, you know, many of those significant um, uh, markers of health. So the frequency matters. That's something that I, I want to stress. And the th not, another thing about it is, is we talked about compliance. 10-minute walks are really easy to comply with. Going to the gym and walking the treadmill for 30, 40 minutes, nobody does that for any extended period of time. Mm -hmm. The 10-minute walks, you can eat breakfast, take a 10-minute walk, and then get in your car and go to work. Uh, I travel almost every weekend. Now, I get three 10-minute walks in easily. I'm walking around the airport while I'm waiting for the bags. While everybody's sitting there at baggage claim waiting for the, the bags to come, uh, I'm, I'm taking circles around baggage claim. Uh, when I get up in the morning at a hotel, I just walk around the hotel in the morning. Or generally, they'll have a little recumbent bike or a treadmill in the workout room, and I'll go in there. If the weather's bad, Hofthor has a bike in his garage, and he uses that because he's in Iceland and it's it's cold. Yeah, it's cold. I yeah. bought a two hundred dollar uh, recumbent bike off of uh, Craigslist, and it's sitting in my garage. Or you could just replace your recliner with it if, if if you were so inclined. And when you get done eating, go sit on your recumbent bike or your stationary bike, and you can watch TV or play on your phone. But at least you're moving, and it's just ten minutes. I actually like to do thirty seconds of a kind of a brisk pedal with a 30 second rest under a modest tension. And then at the end of the 10 minutes, I've got a little pump in my legs. It's been dramatic for helping my knees. It's another thing about the walks or the frequent movements and all the blood flow is the number one uh, uh, method to, to help your joints is with the frequent movements because the blood flow actually heals the joints. And so I've used that to, to get rid of chronic tendonitis in my knees, hips. I had a, a back injury from deadlifting and squatting too much. Uh, too often, and I uh, rehab that with mostly just ten minute walks and and uh, and just general movement. And, and anybody who I know that you also sorry to interrupt. I know that you also used a lot of Stuart McGill's techniques and the big three and some of the exercises for rehabbing your back. Are you still using those? Absolutely, and Stuart's a big proponent of movement. That that if you become kinesophobic because you you uh, have an injury, so you stop moving. Maybe you go to a chiropractor to, uh, for quote-unquote treatment, but then you become sedentary. You sit around thinking that that's the fix. Uh, when you go to a physical therapist or a chiropractor for back injury, they should be facilitators of movement. They should in, find some way of relieving the pain such that you can move. Their pain relief uh, manipulation is temporary and superficial. You moving is what actually heals the muscles and uh, prevents the atrophy of the muscles. You need stability, and that's what the walks are so great about. Is uh, don't do a bunch of stretching and, and bending and twisting of your of your spine. Uh, create stability and a lot of blood flow. And the same thing with the knees. So some people who have very um, 
uh, severe knee problems might end up just sitting on the edge of a therapy table and swinging their legs forward and back for 10 minutes three times a day. The blood flow is what's critical. That's why we're going in to get PRP shots and prolotherapy and stem cells. The whole focus of all of those therapies, which I think are, are, uh, aren't necessarily uh, terribly effective uh, in and of themselves, only so much as they provide you uh, some pain relief so that you can move more. It's the movement, uh, the blood flow that's that's critical. Your joints are synovial joints. They're surrounded by fluid and getting oxygen and nutrients into those uh, cartilaginous structures, your meniscus and um, the cartilage in your knees. Uh, only about 10% of that oxygen and nutrients gets to the cartilage through um, convection, uh, which is just a, uh, or through diffusion, which is just a, a, a gradient um, of, uh, of oxygen. Convection is the actual movement. When you move those, those tissues, they, they squish like a, a sponge and absorb and squish and absorb. And it's that squishing and absorbing over and over and over again, again, frequency being more important than duration, uh, multiple times a day that pumps tons and tons of blood and nutrients into those joints. And so you should constantly be moving. The 10 minute walks are extraordinary for all of those things. And it's incredible to hear you. Uh, I mean, it, it's always a workshop whenever you talk. Can, can you go to dinner parties without giving people a workshop? <laughs> <laughs> I, I get asked. I, I could, but it, there's, inevitably there's someone there that, that, that uh, you know, has, and as we all do, you know, the, the back injury, why I talk about back injury so often is, is because the number one injury um, that people, or just back pain in general, is kind of the number one complaint that people have and oh yeah uh you know it's just and it's so multifaceted i, I wish that there was a fix for any of these things and yeah i talk about my diet it's not just food it's it's sleep it's hydration it's the 10 minute walks it's nutrition uh, it's very comprehensive if somebody asks me about their blood pressure there's 10 things you have to do not just one you know you have to to, to remedy apnea you have to improve your thyroid function uh, whether that be with more sleep or weight loss or getting adequate iodine, which uh, you know we got to get wanted to get back to that just briefly when you talked about sea salt. All salt is great, but make sure you get an iodine source, whether it's kelp or cranberry juice or something. If you're sweating and moving around, iodine is very important for the thyroid function, which has a dramatic effect on more than just uh, metabolism. It's important for uh, cholesterol function, uh, blood pressure. It's huge, uh, you know, apnea and, and, and uh, thyroid function are the two biggest contributors to high blood pressure. So if somebody asks me about blood sugars, again, it's 10 things, it's not one thing. You know, you yes. have to, to uh, implement a host of different uh, remedies to, to really combat the problem. Yes, That's there's no just, one size fits all, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's no. all, the answer will always be, it depends. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I wanted to ask you in terms of uh, uh, flexibility, in terms of stretching, and sometimes it's a little bit difficult for me to answer those questions because in my world, I mean, as a martial artist, I have to be very flexible. And uh, some people are dancers and need to be very flexible. So they really need static stretching. But how do we decide who needs static or dynamic stretching or mobility work, which I guess it's a uh, range of motion through tension or, and where does that stability that you were talking about come in? How, when yeah. and how to I'm stretch. glad you asked. Yeah. I have to, I have to carefully walk into this uh, hornet's <laughs> nest because <Yeah. laughs> people think that, that, that here's the thing about stretching. Uh, Range of motion is important in so much as um, having adequate range of motion to perform the sport that you're involved in. If it's squatting, you have to get below parallel. If it's uh, dancing, of course, you're gonna have to have a particular range of motion, gymnastics, uh, MMA, jujitsu, you get a range of motion. Having said that, uh, the, the, the research has, has been uh, consistent and uh, it's it, there's a lot of it to show that Stretching before training does not decrease injury, might even increase injury, and it may decrease performance. Even if it's so dynamic stretching? Problem. Even if it's dynamic stretching? Okay, I should be more specific. Okay. Static holds. for greater Okay, than static seconds. holds. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Yeah. 
the static hold for greater than 30 seconds before training. We used to do this back when I was coaching soccer in, in the late 80s. I was a high school soccer coach. We'd get out and stretch. Football players used to all come out an hour before the game and stretch. You don't see that anymore. And there's a reason for that. It's because it didn't decrease injuries and it did decrease performance and potentially increased injuries. I'll talk through it a little bit more. Stretching after training does not improve recovery. There's no evidence that there's a physiological benefit to uh, stretching for decreasing DOMS uh, or the like. Um, now, again, that's static stretching. Yes. Now, mobility or dynamic stretching or warm-ups, dynamic warm-ups, what you do see is people going through and they start, you know, doing the, the knee ups and uh, the side to side lateral movements and swinging their legs and that kind of thing is definitely beneficial for uh, increasing uh, blood flow in particular and potentiating the muscles that are going to be necessary to perform whatever task that uh, you're about to perform. Now, in terms of range of motion uh, or flexibility, we'll talk about flexibility. And this has been studied, I think it was an Australia study where they looked at dancers in particular, ballet <laughs> dancers. When you stretch, if, if you increase range of motion, but don't have a concurrent increase in strength and stability, you actually expose yourself to greater risk of injury because that increased range of motion is less stable. So now you may be in a stretched position, but not have the stability to resist uh, whatever kind of load that the, that the sport is demanding on you. And we see this with dancers with uh, uh, stretching their calves and trying to get a greater range of motion. So the solution to that is, is the best stretch is a stretch that's done under tension. You mentioned uh, a loaded stretch. Um, say, rather than just sitting there passively doing stretching your calves, you actually have some weight, uh, like on a calf press machine, uh, and you go through a full range of motion under load, thereby uh, providing strength throughout that new range of motion. And hyperflexibility, for being more flexible than the demand of your sport, can actually uh, diminish performance. It's uh, uh, because you you have to control that range of motion and coordinate it both in terms of uh, you know the nerves, the the muscle coordination, and the strength. So you got to be careful how much you stretch, and uh, depending on the demand of your sport. So I, I just I don't see a lot of benefit to it. I think that people should move a lot in mobility, swinging your leg, going through these dynamic movements. Uh, if you have a specific demand that's beyond your current range of motion, it should be a loaded. Uh, it should be very very deliberate loaded stretching so that you maintain strength throughout that range of motion. Uh, you know, it's not to say that people that do yoga, it's bad for you. I, I think that all exercise is, is preferential to no exercise. Uh, but just understand that, that what we see a lot in people with yoga, particularly, you know, and yoga isn't just stretching. Yoga does some strength movements as well. And all of that, I think, is great. Uh, but you got to be careful how, how much uh, you're stretching your spine. It, it can actually expose you to... Um, uh, to mobility that, that can cause you to have injury of the spine. I think that uh, what Dr. McGill says is you delaminate the discs. And so you, you decrease the rigidity and the stability of the spine, which is supposed to be, um, uh, you know, I've said that the, the, the spine is not a flexor, it's a stabilizer. And it's not intended to, to bend and stretch, it's intended to resist movement. That's what all the muscles of the core and the girdle are for is to resist movement as you walk, as you run, everything in your midsection is working uh, counterclockwise to your to whatever force you're producing against it. Uh, if you look at the physiology of, of running, uh, when your left leg, uh, you know, your left thigh, when your adductor um, pumps that thigh up to propel you, uh, the left side, your right thigh goes up, your left side has to counterbalance that or you just spin in circles. You know, <laughs> if, if you can follow that, it's kind of a, a real simple explanation, but your, your, your core is constantly resisting movement. That's what it's intended to do, which is why things like um, the McGill Big Three or, uh, you know, just any kind of stabilization work, um, uh, like a suitcase carry or things like that are much better for uh, core developing the the muscles of the core for the purpose that they're intended as opposed to a lot of um, you know toe touching and and uh, 
arching and things like that. I, I don't think that's a good idea, particularly for, well, for anybody, not for athletes or for, uh, you know, the average population. I think you got to work on mm -hmm. stability. Strength is always uh, a priority. Yeah, strength is never a weakness, like Mark Bell says, right? <laughs> exactly. 100% right. Um, if uh, you had to choose between strength training and cardio, you would choose strength training. If it were one or the other, it would be strength sure. training. For sure. 100%. Yeah. In terms of longevity, in terms of, of uh, quality of life, in terms of uh, fending off uh, injury or illness, uh, muscle tissue is, is your absolutely your, your reserve for getting you through situations like that. Yeah, and it's it sucks that we still have to instill that in most people because a lot of people, especially maybe women, are are a little bit more 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 guilty of this of thinking that uh, cardio, cardio, cardio will be the best way. But a lot of guys I know as well, so it's not really it's not really a gender thing. It's it's really a, a basic lack of information, and even sometimes they listen to it. Oh yeah, I know, I know, but they're they're always going to go on the treadmill and thinking they're uh, going to shed the weight or look more ripped and toned. And and defined uh, by doing that. Um, I just wanted to ask no, you because weight loss is weight yeah. loss is ninety nine percent diet. It's yeah. not cardio. It's not cardio. And yeah, cardiovascular fitness, cardiovascular fitness for your uh, for your general health, uh, it's a very low bar. It's they measure that your VO two max is measured in mets and about seven to eight metabolic equivalents is about a thirteen minute mile. You can get that with a brisk ten minute walk three times a day. You don't need to do anymore. If you want to, if you enjoy jogging or sprinting, you certainly can. You're also going to get a, an extraordinary elevation of your heart rate just from going in and doing some squats, which I think is much more beneficial. Oh, yeah. I, I know about the 20 reps. I know about the 20 reps. I saw I saw your videos, man. The, the, don't scare me with that. Come on. Uh, but, uh, speaking of your yeah. videos, I just saw a video on your Instagram with Eddie Cohen. You were doing – I don't think – I didn't think this could be possible, but – is your squat even getting better, you know, technique-wise? Because you always were very famous for having a very vertical shin. But your squat right now, I'm guessing you're putting your barbell a little bit lower on your back. Are you going for a, a, an even deeper, lower back squat? Are you working with Mark Ripito on that or something? Uh, two different things. Powerlifting is about leverages. Mm. And when I powerlifted... I tried to find uh, where I was the strongest, where I used the least muscle and the most leverage, to be honest with you. And so I had a very vertical shin. I had a wide stance. I had a very uh, vertical torso uh, because I found that, that I was able to lift more weight there. But it also exposed me to repetitive strain and, and injury over the years. My knees and my hips suffered a lot from, from that kind of training. So after I retired from powerlifting and I just wanted to find the kinds of movement that would uh, give me the best uh, long-term health that would work my muscles and not my joints, um, I, uh, I was fortunate to come across Mark Ripito's work at Starting Strength. And, uh, you know, he's just a, an absolute expert in, in physics. And, uh, and so he has designed a, a method of squatting that's most optimal for, uh, I think, for minimizing the impact on the joints. And so I went to his seminar and I've been working with him ever since for over a year now. And so the, the movement that I currently use is, is, is intended to minimize joint stress. And so I do keep a reasonably vertical shin to minimize the impact on the knee, but I'm loading more of my glutes now uh, than I did historically. And I'm shortening the, uh, what we call the moment arm, the distance between uh, my lower back and the bar, uh, which is your fulcrum, what would you call your fulcrum point? And the further that bar gets away from the fulcrum point, obviously the more stress that you place on the fulcrum. It's kind of like give me a lever long enough and I can move the earth, Archimedes. Uh, so I've just, I've just uh, adopted his program because it feels so good on the body. So now I can squat pain free. That's my primary focus now is longevity. I can't lift as much as I used to lift because I'm not loading my joints. Uh, as severely as I used to. I had, you know, chronic tendonitis in my knees and I had uh, really bad hip pain for years uh, because that's, you know, where I tended to wedge all of the weight over the years. So yeah, I, Mark Ripito has got a lot of videos on YouTube that shows how to go through a low bar squat. I did that video with uh, Juji. Juji Mufu, uh, Mufu yeah, yeah. on, um, yep, yeah, where I kind of talked him through the process and using the hip drive and 
lowering the bar a little bit so that the bar stayed over your center of gravity and shortened the, the moment arm, the range, uh, the distance between the fulcrum and the bar. And it's just more efficient. Uh, you still recruit a lot of muscle and glutes and, and quads, obviously, and uh, uh, it's a great workout. But at the end of the day, I, don't, I can't talk about it in terms of a, what's best, high bar or low bar. That doesn't mean anything to me. What means something to me is that it's pain-free and that it, it's comfortable and uh, that people do it. My most important goal is when I go in to try and teach somebody how to squat, I'm trying to find out uh, how to move them so that it's enjoyable for them and it's not um, going to be painful for them. Because just like diet, uh, the best exercise is the one you'll do. And if, yes. if they don't enjoy squatting, they're not going to do it. They're not going to come back next week and do it. And so I don't try and turn it into a golf swing. I try and get them just to sit down and up out of a chair uh, in, in a manner that's comfortable for them, that, that their knees aren't exposed to a whole lot of range over their toes. Um, most beginners and intermediates in particular, they're you know reluctant to, to put a lot of that stress on their, on their joints. It just doesn't feel good, so they won't do it. Yeah, just a couple of quick, quick questions about the future of powerlifting. You being, and a lot of people might not sure. know this, you being the strongest bodybuilder ever. I mean, can, can you can you can you remind us what your biggest marks were on uh, on your uh, lifts? Yeah, my biggest bench ever was a six oh six. My squat <laughs> was eight fifty four with uh, no knee wraps. It was just in sleeves. And the deadlift was 837. So I totaled uh, 2,303 pounds in the 275 class. Dude, you're crazy, um, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, was, that was a fun time. It was, it was painful. I, I yeah. don't necessarily encourage it. I enjoy watching others do it now. It, it's, a, it's a hell of a sport. Do you, th do you think uh, uh, the 500-kilo uh, barrier will ever be uh, – I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not converting it into pounds. It's probably, what, 1,100 pounds or something? 1,100. Yeah, yeah. 1,100. The 500-kilo uh, barrier on the deadlift world, it, will, will it ever be uh, uh, beaten or, and will it be like a, a future standard? Uh, is it, is it going to be like a lot of sports in the Olympics where you know each year the records will be broken or something? What do you, th what do you feel about that in the future? Well, I mean, Hofthor is obviously very close. Yeah. He just pulled that 1,058 in training. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember, Hofthor did that uh, without a triple ply deadlift suit. The, the thing is, is there's a, a lot of different variations. When you look at, uh, is it raw with no wrist wraps? Is it raw with no suit? Is it wrist wraps and suit? Is it a, uh, is an extra bendy, extra long bar? You know, it, there's a whole lot, of, like Eddie Cohn pulled a stiff bar and pulled 900. Now they've got those really bendy, oaky bars, uh, and they're pulling, you know, 970. Uh, so in his weight class. And so you get, the equipment is different. The uh, the gear, by gear, I mean the, the, the suits, the, yeah. the deadlift suits is different. The straps is different. So it's hard really to make an apples to apples. I think it's extraordinary, you know, to see what, these guys are doing either way. Uh, but if you want to compare apples to apples, I think if Hofthor threw on a, uh, a triple ply suit that he's really darn close. I think what Eddie Hall did was extraordinary. Um, you know, I, I think that what, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these big deadlifters, who was it? Was it Benedict that did the, uh, um, did the thousand pounds with no wrist wraps it was extraordinary. That's um, crazy. It's crazy. Know, and a strongman, strong, I, I, I've been a, a huge follower of strongman ever, ever since uh, Marius Pujanowski and and even uh, even uh, um, Jan Paul, Jan Paul uh, Sigmarsson. I, I watched a lot of his, yeah. of his stuff. So uh, what I what I can really tell is that strongman has become has become more monstrous. You know, it's like more of one rep max and not as much. Uh, you know, those circuits that they used to do in in Marius Puzianowski's time or in the eight or eighties or in the nineties. So I'm I'm curious to see where where the bar will go, where the needle will be put in in the in the next few years. It's it's crazy, man. <laughs> Yeah, those, those competitions are getting heavier and heavier, and the guys are getting bigger and bigger. Marius was famous for his gas tank. He, uh, yeah. he was able to do a lot of those, and he would tire the other guys out. 
Now the weights are huge. You've got 13, 1400 pound yokes. You've got, uh, you know, the max deadlifts now are over a thousand pounds. There's half a dozen guys pulling damn near a thousand or more, uh, you know, Jerry Pritchett and others. Uh, it, it's pretty extraordinary the loads that they're putting them under and it, it, it has become, you know, the biggest, the most massive guys. There are some events like at the world's strongest man, they ran them through a medley in the sand. That, that's not an advantage for a 400 plus pound guy. Uh, <laughs> no, so, no, sir. <laughs> there's some equalizers. It kind of just depends on what events they choose. The Arnold historically has been known for its heavy movements. And so I think Hofter will fare very, very well there. Um, obviously, Dubai is a very, very heavy, heavy show. Um, there was one in, I think, Spain earlier this year. It was a lot of medleys. Uh, so, uh, and the world's strongest man was kind of a 50-50. They had some medleys and they had some strong stuff. So, uh, it's always interesting to see how the the events line up and who it advantages. Uh, you know, based on their uh, kind of what weight they are and whether or not they have that gas tank. Not speaking of today's competitors, because you might be a little bit biased on that. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't. I wouldn't want to put you in in any in, in, in a jeopardy in any uh, uncomfortable situation. But from the past, you know, guys like Pujanowski, like uh, Jan Paul, like uh, Kaz Meyer and stuff. Uh, either from the powerlifting or from the strongman or even from bodybuilding, who were your your biggest influences or who were your favorite ones? Yeah, and strongman, obviously, Kaz and Pujanowski were were you know just great people to watch. Ever since I was a teenager, my dad, we used to sit around and watch the world's strongest man. Uh, bodybuilding, it was always, you know, the Flex Wheeler was, was one of the ones that at the time I was coming up that was in the magazines. Uh, him and Chris Cormier training together with Charles Glass. And I was fortunate to be able to go down and train with all of them uh, later in my career. Um, and then in powerlifting, you know, for the longest time, I didn't follow too many powerlifters. It wasn't as well publicized. You know, they weren't on TV, they weren't in the magazines. And so, it really wasn't until, uh, you know, and I just say this as, as a matter of, of fact, really, until uh, I started competing with Mark Bell, you know, because I was competing in powerlifting in, in the early 90s, but it wasn't until I started competing with Mark Bell back in 2009 that I really started to, to look at more of the powerlifters' names and follow KK, you know, Constantin, uh, who was the 275 record holder at the time that I came up. And so I started focusing on who were the big hitters then. And, uh, and then the publicity started to come, uh, you know, social media was just in its infancy there. And we started publishing, uh, videos on YouTube and, um, I was in the magazines for bodybuilding, but it, it kind of lent itself well to publicizing powerlifting. I got into, um, muscle and fitness and I got into flex magazine. I got into, uh, what was the other one that I, I got into was, uh, um, muscle, I forget, but. Anyhow, it was, you know, it was 2009, 2010, 2011. And uh, so all of a sudden powerlifting started getting a little more uh, publicity because of social media. Lifters were able to, to put out their own lifts every weekend, whether it was Instagram or, or YouTube. And from there, it started exploding. I think one of the biggest things that's grown powerlifting, to be honest with you, is actually CrossFit. I found that, that particularly with respect with women, now you see meets, they're, they're, the women have filled up the whole day. They've got 45 competitors on a, on a given day. A lot of the women that get into CrossFit, they start feeling the squats and the deadlifts and really like it and end up uh, competing in powerlifting on the single lift. It's, it's so rewarding to watch the weight climb on the bar so quickly uh, yeah, that, that they've now gotten involved in a big way into powerlifting. So it's, it's a lot more diverse and a lot more people participating. And uh, you can see powerlifting videos every single day on Instagram of extraordinary things that people are doing. Yeah, it's, it's funny to see that women are much closer to the big weights in uh, competitive powerlifting in, in terms of the CrossFit athletes uh, than the men, uh, which might mean that women will be able to handle we already know that's from this from from research but women are able to handle much more volume than the guys and still be strong which is quite a quite a quite a finding yeah. actually uh, uh, in, uh, i would just like to finish up with some mindset questions uh, the first one being more of a um more of a thing that I really love that you said in another interview, interview, which is bodybuilding is not a profession, it's not a job, it's a hobby. Would you care to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, boy, I've been asked so many times over the year, people talking about their, their they wanted to work on their career in bodybuilding or powerlifting or what have you. And 
it's not a career. Uh, you know, it's a hobby, and it's certainly a, a, a pursuit that can be very rewarding for people who, you know, choose for that to be their interest. But it's really important, and, and a lot of people ask me about things like sponsorships and like, these days it doesn't happen anymore. You, you aren't going to get discovered, and nobody's going to come hand you anything. Uh, you got to create it for yourself. Even a guy like Larry Wheels, as, uh, as huge as, as he is and as much potential, uh, his sponsorship was like $2,000 a month, which is like the, one of the only guys that was getting paid. But that pales in comparison to what he's created for himself since then. Uh, the, 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 the weeder sponsorships from of old and the muscle tech sponsorships and those, they don't exist anymore for an athlete just because of their uh, their accomplishments in competition. You have to create some sort of draw. You have to have some sort of social media following. You have to have some, create some value for the business. Uh, but by the same token, if you do create value, if you do create content and develop a following and have some YouTube and some Instagram, you can also create your own products and services. And now you aren't uh, uh, a slave to the, you, to the sport, you know, right? Yeah, and you, and you don't have to get underpaid. You can have your yeah. own, you know, when I say goods and services, you, you can have t-shirts and, and uh, you can have ebooks, and you can uh, do online training and you can uh, do, uh, you know, coffee or supplements or you can do your own these days. There's many, many companies out there that will private label for you and just have become your own brand. You have to anyhow. If you don't become your own brand, nobody's going to pay you. Some people get paid just to market other people's products uh, as an influencer or an affiliate type of deal. Uh, either way, uh, the idea that, that, that you can shop around and somebody's going to pay you to do what you're doing uh, doesn't exist anymore. And you're going to have to create your own following. And that's just going to take, uh, you know, Mark Bell did it from scratch. Uh, he, he, he's been banging away at it for a long time since, uh, um, you know, 2009 or even a little before that, but really started getting a lot of, uh, putting up a lot of content since 2009 and 10. And now he's, he's got a, that's what he does primarily. And it's free content. Understand that nobody's paying you for the information. My rants are free and my, you know, my, my videos is all free information, uh, just so you can monetize products, goods and services that people want. And that's, that's great advice. Everybody's got to be a little bit of an entrepreneur and some people hate this word. Yeah. I hate that word, but you got to be, you got to be, you got to be proactive in that sense. So a lot of artists, which I deal with a lot because being a stuntman, I have to coordinate a lot of uh, the, the action scenes for films and for uh, TV shows and whatnot with actors. And they always believe that I'm an artist, so they have to come pick me up because I'm so talented. No, you got to put yourself out there. If people don't know who the fuck you are, why would they Hire you in the same thing for athletes. A lot of athletes asking me, "Oh, how can how can I get sponsors?" Well, be great at what you do, but also be shown. If if I write your name on YouTube, if I write your name on Google, if if nothing comes up, I mean that's 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 your problem, not theirs. So, um, excellent advice on being. Uh, 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 valuable to the companies uh, and and to the possible sponsors that might come up your way. And the other thing that you always talk about, I would really like to finish up with this because this is a huge kudos to you because you definitely were not born with the best genetics. You all already told us that you went to college being uh, 140 pounds. But because of a little bit of your, and you said it yourself, so I can say it as well, a little bit of your OCD, you managed to be disciplined and proactive enough to reach where you are today. So um, how do we dribble or how were you able to dribble those not excellent genetics that you have in or that you had in order to become who you are today in a nutshell? Well, <laughs> you know, I, we, we said it with dieting. Compliance is the science. It's, it's about it's about repetitively performing those tasks which uh, are successful. I did it in business. I've run, started five different startup companies that I've developed into multi-million dollar businesses over the last 15 years. And each and every one, just like bodybuilding, just like powerlifting, required that I got up every day and I had a, a certain checklist uh, 
I'm six years past my last competition. I still have a daily checklist. I still record my weight every day, how many meals I ate, whether I took 10 minute walks. Matter of fact, the new vertical tracker app that I've been working on developing for the last year, it's out now. We're still working through the last of the details on it, but um, it's a tracker. And all it does uh, with my OCD is it allows me to, to check boxes every single day. Did you eat your four meals or your five meals? Did you get your 250 or 200 grams of protein? Did you take your 10 minute walks? What did you train today? You know, And then some progression as to the intensity of that. In business, it was, um, you know, this repetitive behaviors for me, depending on which business it was in, uh, was just things like your marketing, your consistency in, in marketing. We talked about building a social media presence. If you're not posting every single day, you're not serious. And those kinds of things are, are just the repetitive behaviors. Um, for me, at a couple points in my career, when um, I was not paying attention to my health, my uh, uh, I wasn't sleeping enough, I wasn't exercising, I wasn't going to the gym, I was eating at McDonald's every day. I really started to decline. I started to get stressed out and anxiety. And you know, when you're running a business 18 hours plus a day and you got payroll to meet, um, and my performance started to decline and I really started to suffer in terms of health. So I had to get back to you know, paying myself first is what I call it at my rant, stress for success. I discussed the fact that you, you've got to, you got to pay attention to your sleep. You got to pay attention to the regular exercise and to your nutrition. Those things are critical and essential, both for performance in sports, but also in business. And so I was, I was just a, um, I don't think I was any smarter or any uh, harder working than a lot of the people in, in they're successful in business and sports, but I was really, really consistent. And so I didn't have a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you know, ups and downs. Uh, I might have, I had plenty of plateaus, uh, but I, I was just so consistent over such a long period of time, every day, every week, every month, every year, and now for three decades. I've just repeated a lot of the same behaviors that uh, returned to me some sort of progress. And I doubled down on those that worked. And I, um, like you said, with, you know, sampling different diet plans every 30 days. I, you know, I, I took away the things that, that worked. I incorporated them into my repetitive, repeated behaviors, and I got rid of those that, that didn't work. And so, you know, the, the biggest message I can send is that you really got to got to sit down and figure out what, what action items do I need to complete every single day? Uh, if you want to bench 500 and you're currently bench 200, you can't go to the gym tomorrow and put 500 on the bar. It doesn't work that way. But you know you can do you can get from 200 to 200 for four reps and 200 for five reps and maybe three sets of 200 for five reps and then maybe 210 for four reps. You you, you see where I'm headed with this. I did the same thing in powerlifting as bodybuilding as as business. Is I just started wherever I was. If you're looking at Instagram and you want to become somebody on there, that's you know, why I did my rant. Fuck Mike O'Hearn. Uh, because it, it, it's it's so discouraging when you get on Instagram every day. It'll just wipe you out thinking that I'm not that person. I'll never be that person. Uh, well, you know, if you just start repeating the behaviors that, that make you successful over and over again, within a year or three or five, if depending on your patience and your persistence, um, you're going to be pretty remarkable. Uh, anybody and whatever pursuit they they decide to pursue and i've said that anybody who's been successful in bodybuilding with the discipline and, and consistency that's required with the the, the you know the, the nutrition and the training and the sleep and the uh the posing and all the other stuff if you put the same amount of consistency and time management and effort into any income producing venture whether it be starting a t-shirt line or uh, uh, your own supplement line or, or writing up an ebook or doing personal training online or even personal training locally at the gym. If you committed the same amount of, uh, of discipline and consistency into any venture and grew it over time, you'd be a millionaire in five years. And I, and, and I, I believe that wholeheartedly. And I've, I've done it at least five times over the last 15 years, built successful companies just out of dogged persistence and consistency and with my OCD behavior and repeating those and, and writing everything down every single day, having a list of action items and crossing them off. And I don't use 
my phone to create lists of to do's uh, because to me it's like a junk drawer you just put it in there and you forget about it i have a, a yellow pad of paper that i carry around it's in my car next to me when i'm driving around i got a list of to do's and and a lot of those things are the same things and i have to prioritize them into those that are uh, a lot of us we got to get preoccupied with crossing off a lot of little things um when you know we postpone the things that are really going to have the most dramatic uh, long-term effect on our on our uh, success so and so being old school <laughs> with the with the yellow pad and being consistent yeah. though, that's that's what matters right rhino can i call you rhino <laughs> yeah it's staring you in the face every single day you're looking at what you need to do you've sat down and you've made a plan it's no different than writing out a diet plan and sticking it to your refrigerator or writing out a workout plan and going to the gym and and putting in, you know, four sets of 10 reps with, you know, X amount of weight. And the next time you go in, you do X plus five or you do one extra rep. If you're tracking your diet and your training, then you should also be tracking uh, any, um, you know, business pursuit that you're inclined to, to be focused on with the same amount of, of discipline and consistency and simplicity with that uh, checklist. Rhino, thank you so much for this. I mean, this this is a whole workshop. So I, I a lot of tools for our listeners and our, our audience, our viewers as well. Uh, and uh, I'm going to personally subtitle everything in Portuguese because I really want you to, to want you to get acquainted with the, with the Portuguese audience and the other way around as well, obviously, and the Brazilian people. Uh, so since I'm going to have the consistency and the proactiveness of subtitling our whole conversation, which is about what an hour and 20 minutes so far, or an hour and a half, you got to come to Portugal, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> Anytime. Yeah. You guys, uh, you guys get me a, you guys get me an airplane ticket and I'm there, man. Well, well consider it done, man. We're, we're going to talk. We're going to talk. Anytime, Good time, my friend. Oh man. Perfect. Let's get vertical. <laughs> awesome. Thanks brother. Rhino, thank you so much. Uh, have a great one, and uh, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much, man. <laughs> Appreciate it. Take See care. See you later. Man. See you later. Bye, Stan. <laughs>